Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. Uh, my name is Rick Archer, and this is a weekly show in which I speak with someone um, who has undergone a spiritual awakening, and different guests tend to define that differently, but I think that's over time providing a very interesting perspective on the varieties of, uh, in which, the different ways in which spiritual awakening can show up. Um, my guest this week is a dear old friend of mine named Egal Moria, and uh, Egal and I have known each other for probably over three decades and had all sorts of adventures together um, here in Fairfield, Iowa when we were students at Marshy International University and then on courses and international staff of the TM movement in Switzerland and various other European countries, in India. Uh, we were on a big project together in the Philippines where um, Igal was head of a comparative religions uh, development group, which maybe he'll talk about more, and, and I was working with him on that. So we've had all kinds of adventures. and. Uh, in recent years, uh, we both branched off in, in different directions, but we've stayed in touch. And I think I'll start by having Egal um, just fill out his own biography a little bit, give us a sense of, uh, you know, what, where he's from and wh what his course of, of life has been. And then we'll get more deeply into the interview. So take it away. Okay. So I was born... 56 years ago in Israel, in Tel Aviv, and I grew up there. And sometime during my military service, at uh, age 19, I came across Transcendental Meditation. And shortly afterwards, I, uh, maybe three weeks afterwards, I heard a, uh, an audio tape by Maharshi, in which he described cosmic consciousness. And I remember that hearing him say those words, cosmic consciousness, and also it was in the context of residence course where we did some more meditation. It was as if my whole life was sorted for me at that point. Sorted? Sorted, yes. Right, right. In the sense that I knew, okay, I'm going to learn with this man. I'm going to teach the meditation. And I'm going to spend as much time as I can working with him and learning with him. Mm -hmm. And it was just basically, it was like until that moment, I was a confused teenager who basically didn't know left from right. And at that moment, it's as if everything got sorted. It got very simple. It was very clear that this is what I have to do and this is what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what happened. And I spent... Uh, uh, 25 years from from that year, which is 1973 to 1998, Maharshi was uh, the hub of my life. I was uh, a teacher. I was made a teacher very soon afterwards. I uh, started working with him uh, on religion. On, he recognized very early on my passion for religion and my insight into religious texts and asked me to look into the different religions. And uh, that was until 1998. And uh, to just condense everything very shortly, around that time, I had already started kind of feeling that, uh, uh, not that it's time for something else, but I... Uh, I was already in Israel, and even though he at one point invited me back to, I kind of felt that it was uh, that chapter with him was over, and I thought I'll continue teaching TM. I was a very successful TM teacher in the 90s. Uh, I was sometimes teaching 50 to 60 people a month, and uh, and I was living comfortably, and I felt okay. So that's how life is gonna. That's the shape life is gonna take. And uh, I was also becoming very uh, well known in Israel, in interviews on TV, radio. Everything was just, you know, a perfect bourgeois picture. So why and then, did you feel like you might have been feeling like that chapter was almost over if everything was going so well? No, the chapter with working with Maharshi closely was over. And why was that? Was it was he less accessible or something? No, uh, I. 
I don't know how much uh, it makes sense to go into this in the context of our conversation, but I'll say in a nutshell that uh, two and a half years ago, before that, or three years before that, he actually asked me to leave the ashram. Uh, that I was, uh, I was with him in uh, Flodrop in Holland, and he asked me to leave, which was a shock for everybody uh, involved, not already. And the reason he he said that he said you have become too independent for me because uh, I I have become independent. I have started realizing. Look, I'm forty something. Uh, the reason I joined Maharshi was in order to be enlightened. I didn't join him just to teach DM and to work on religion. Mm -hmm. And I realized that I was not much closer to enlightenment after 20 some years with him. And then I was in the beginning, mm -hmm. I knew a lot more about it. I had fantastic experiences with him. I loved him dearly. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had full confidence in his enlightenment and I loved TM. But I was not enlightened, and I was, and to be honest, I didn't see around me people that I could uh, be inspired by their level of enlightenment, right. to put it mildly. Uh -huh. And on top of that, I also saw that uh, another thing that started bothering me is I realized that neither I nor many around me, after many, many years of practice, even though the practice has become in some ways more proficient, that we have become more moral people. Huh. And I saw this of myself. I said, no, I have actually, you know, Maharshi's, uh, always emphasis, Maharshi's emphasis was always on just do the practice and then you will change morally. And there was even research to show that uh, you become more moral person just by practicing TM. And I... I didn't feel I was in any way morally, spiritually different than I was when I came to him. And again, I must say that at least from my perspective, limited as it was, I could not see that anybody in the circles that I was with, which was those that are closest to him, was in any way an exemplary of enlightenment or purity of motive or of anything of that sort. Yes. So I became to actually look for my own, to, to, to try and find my, my own way of making sense of the whole thing, yeah. of my own life. I'm, glad without you, and I'm not, I don't mean to interrupt, but I'm saying, I just want to say that I'm glad you went into all that because it parallels my experience very much. Um, mm -hmm. I won't elaborate on that now because this is, I'm interviewing you, but uh, <laughs> we both went very, through very similar realizations. Yeah. And, uh, and he was very confusing, I must tell you, because, I, as I said, I loved him dearly. I was very attached to him. Uh, not attached, in, uh, att attached also, also in a personal way, because he was extremely fatherly to me all of, the, all of the years. I mean, just as an example, when my father died, he invited my mother to come and live with us. I mean, he was, like, unbelievably generous and... And he uh, always uh, always encouraging and lifting. So there was a very personal dimension to this, and I I didn't I could not at that time conceive of my life away from the ashram. But I felt I have to find a way of making sense of the whole thing on my own. And at one point, definitely, I I, I pushed the edge. Were you and when doing I doing things that were overtly? I was. Uh... Yeah, I was doing things which are overtly not ash. I mean, I don't want to go into the, all this right. details, but I definitely was not towing the line. So it wasn't just a subtle, uh, su subtle inner independence. Well, I was behavior. Your behavior was getting more independent. Yeah. 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 It was definitely. It was. It was bothering people around me, and it was bothering him. And in, in a sense, and I, and I, I understood him when he said, "Look, you got, you got." I understood what he said when he said, "You've become too independent for me." I understood it, but he was also. It meant a lot, you know, it, it, it's, it's very revealing. So anyway, I left and it was, I, <laughs> it, uh, it was probably, speaking of experiences, it was probably one of the most traumatic experiences I can think of, you know, and uh, in fact, uh, I, I, on the way to Israel, I stopped for a few weeks with friends in, in Tuscany and I went to an osteopath in Firenze. And after treating me for about 
five, seven minutes, he stopped and asked me if anybody had died in my family recently. And I said, no. And then he said, it's interesting because your, tra your body has a trauma of somebody that I found when their father dies. Interesting, yeah. And it was, it, it was definitely a devastating, a devastating uh, uh, event. And then I went to Israel and not really knowing anything to do, I've been with him since I was a kid. I, the only thing I knew how to do was TM, and the only thing I wanted to do was teach TM, really, because I loved that. That was one thing that I deeply loved, doing pujas, teaching, giving mantras, teaching things. It was fantastic, and everybody in Israel told me, forget it. I mean, you'll never be able to make a living out of it. There's no chance. Everybody tried, failed. And I said, well, let me give it a try. And I said, first course was one person, second course was two people, and third, three people like that kept going. And sure enough, uh, word of mouth got me more and more and more uh, people. And I started actually having big courses. And it was at a time where not very many people were having big courses in the world. And, I, and it was fantastic. It was, and all I kept thinking of was, I want to go back. 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 I have to go back. Back to Maharshi. Yes. Right. In the meantime, life unfolded and things developed, but I, I, in my mind, there was this thing, I want to go back. And then one day I asked him, and, we, and there was some contact also. He, he had, you know, Maharshi, there was something so sweet about him. He had these subtle, indirect way of communication, mm -hmm. which are so Indian, and in which ways that he would let you know that he's thinking of you. Mm. Like, but he wasn't like over her. Well, like, for example, <laughs> the Israeli movement asked for a particular master tape so they can edit it for the natural law party. So he would tell his video people, send it to Igal. Now, there was no objective reason in the world why right. they would send it to me. I wasn't the national leader. I wasn't the head of the NLP, the National Law Party. Mm -hmm. But it was a way of kind of saying, hi, Gal, I'm thinking of you. And all things like that. And he would send some, sometimes he would suddenly have somebody call me and ask some question about religion, mm -hmm. you know, my research. He was you know, very sweet. He said, hey, you know, we're still, everything's cool. You know, just keep on going and keep on going. And at one point, after two and a half years, I asked, can I come back? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, you can. And come back to Purusha. And at that time, they were in North Carolina. And Purusha is a monastic program. Yeah, of which I was a part of. I was a part of that program from its very inception right. from 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a... Uh, and he says, go to that group and join them. And I started packing, and then I actually asked myself, where am I going? Mm -hmm. If I go back, it's going to be to the same questions I had. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved him, and I missed him. But then I had, that was the point where I had to actually admit to myself, it's actually over. And I'm going to stay put. Mm -hmm. And... At one point, I realized there's nowhere to go back to, and I just have to just continue. And I thought, okay, so let me just continue in teaching TM. And, and it was at that point that actually I realized that chapter is, is already closed. With all the nostalgia, with all the love that I felt for him, it was, it was finished. Because mm -hmm. then I knew if I go, went back, it was the same dilemmas. It was the same things that didn't make sense. It was the same... And I just felt okay. You weren't going to see him in North Carolina anyway. You'd just be with a bunch of guys. Well, no, I, the thing is I knew that if he sent me to North Carolina, after a while when he needed something on religion, yeah. he would call me back. Right. I, I had the feeling that that wasn't the, that wasn't the issue. Yeah. That sooner or later, and maybe I was wrong. I didn't know. I had a feeling that it was that way, right. that it would be, because... It's also that he invested a lot in training me, to be honest. I mean, he really did, you know. He... Honest. Are you, uh, uh, training you to be honest, or are you just saying to be honest, he invested a lot in training you? <laughs> to be honest, he, as a mirror, to be honest, he, he's invested a lot. Right, right. 
<laughs> that kind of had me going there for a minute. <laughs> I trained, he, he trained. He invested a lot to train me, you know, and I and I felt that he he hadn't yet that for which he prepared me for. He had not yet started utilizing, you know, uh-huh. which is going out there on, on with the whole the whole religion thing. And uh, but anyway, it was it was it was just a feeling that look, it's over, and there's no, and that's it. And I was thinking that this was it. I was going to finally, at the age of 45, settle down. And I entered. I was in a relationship at the time. After so many years of being a monk, I was. Uh, I had a beautiful house. I was teaching TM. I was successful. And I said, okay, fine. You know, we'll just. But then, you know, I mean, uh, nature has ways of playing tricks on you. Yeah. And uh, I had heard about my present teacher, uh, Andrew Cohen. I had heard about him already sometime in the early 90s. I'd come across something, some magazine, the magazine uh, issue, and I'd seen this picture. I'd heard very good things about him. He's very serious and all that. But I was really not interested, and I never read anything of his. And funnily enough, the fact that he was a New York Jew just put me off. I said, you know, what do New York Jews know about enlightenment, you know? And, uh, and, And funnily enough, I started hearing more and more about him in Israel from all kinds of different directions. It was not from one person. Here one person, somebody mentioned him, and here somebody mentioned him. And I said, wow, that's interesting, but I never, I was not looking for another teacher. I was really satisfied with being, with being a Maharshi student, uh, external student, I mean, a remote student, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then one night, uh, I, you know, Tel Aviv can get very, sticky, humid, and, and hot in the summer and the fall. And one one of those kind of very, very humid nights, you, I couldn't fall asleep, and, and there was so mosquitoes in the air and all that. I was really annoyed, and I just got up and just basically started surfing the web aimlessly. Uh-huh. That any particular thing. And I came across somebody else's site, and they had two articles of Andrew Cohen on that site. Mm-hmm. And I said, hmm, interesting. Again, I hear the name. Yeah. Why don't I read the, the articles? And it was literally out of boredom and having nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. And I was floored. By what you read. Yeah. 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 I was floored because it was like as if somebody had put a mirror to my face. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't a very pretty picture. He was describing in that article the whole predicament of the of the boomer generation and their how they started with a very big passion to gain enlightenment, mm-hmm. and they sold out and they became bourgeois and they settled down and all they wanted is comfort. Mm-hmm. There were things like he was saying, like everybody wants to get enlightenment, but nobody wants to change. Mm-hmm. Powerful things he was saying about the call for integrity. Well, you kind of wanted to change, but you felt like you hadn't changed. Yeah, and I felt that, I, I, and he was saying, the boomers have become cynical about the possibility of change. And I realized this was true about me. Yeah. yeah. I was more interested in teaching a lot of people at the end than I was teaching, you know, interested about getting enlightened at that point. Enlightenment wasn't even something I was even thinking about. I, I kind of gave up. Yeah, there's a lot of people in, in my town here who feel that way. They, they think, you know, I've been doing this for 30, 40 years, and at the rate I'm going, it's not going to happen. So I'm just going to, you know, I'll meditate and work, do my job and raise my family and live out the rest exactly. of my life. And it just isn't going to happen as, you know, the way I thought it was. And that's part, exactly. of, that's part of the reason I've, I got motivated to do this show, because I want to kind of show examples of people who are, in fact, you know, making breakthroughs and yeah. kind of fulfilling the original promise. Right. Well, actually, that's what happened that night. What happened was he, in some way, rekindled the spirit. He, he rekindled in me the spirit 
with which I came to the spiritual life to begin with. Huh. It's like I felt I was 19 again. Wow. And I, I was totally floored. It was it, the two things. At first, I felt that somebody was just gave me a real strong, how do you call it when somebody hits you with a punch? Yeah, it's really a big strong punch, punch in the, in the stomach. Uh -huh. Oh, right. for one it thing. the wind out of you, so to speak. Big, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing was, at the same time, he woke me up, in a sense. Right. He woke me up to what my situation really was mm -hmm. and not my personal situation but the predicament of my entire generation mm -hmm. and he was challenging me to do something about it mm -hmm. and it's it was there was something about it that i could tell the authenticity of his voice it was it was unquestionable for me that he was authentic mm -hmm. that he was not he was really authentic this guy is serious, more serious. He was deadly serious. He was more real than real. And I, at that, at that time, I didn't think I would join him necessarily. But I, as I reread and reread those two articles, maybe 30 or 40 times, wow. I, could, I couldn't move from the screen. Really? It was, that night you sat there and read them? That movie. night I just sat there and I read it and I read it and I couldn't believe I, what I was reading. And I couldn't believe what I was reading and I... And I was just, I, I couldn't have enough of it. And, and at that night, I knew that my, I don't, didn't know how, I didn't know if I would be associated with him necessarily, but I knew that my life as I knew him up until that moment was over. And I'm going to start anew. And I didn't know what it meant. And I also felt that I have to take off the mantle of a teacher. I was becoming a little bit of a spiritual persona. And I, I, I felt that I had to take the mantle off, fold it nicely, put it in the, in the cupboard, and become a student again. And I didn't know it was be with him, but it was, there was a certain sense of that this chapter, it was, this chapter was over. Mm -hmm. In a sense, maybe it was a recognition of something that happened anyway. Yeah. But, but uh, it was basically a recognition, okay, this is where it's at. And the next morning, my girlfriend, when she woke up, I said, I'm stopping to teach DM. And she almost fainted. She said, what happened to you? Did you got sick? Did you? But I said, I'm going to stop teaching TM. Well, as it turned out, I didn't have the guts to really do it for a few more months. Mm -hmm. I started back paddling. Mm -hmm. You know, there are those moments where a bigger truth gets revealed to you as if the screens of perception get lifted off your eyes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the screens that block your perception get lifted off your eyes, and you suddenly see a much bigger truth. Right. And those moments are rare. And this was one of those incredible, miraculous moments. And then you have to respond to it. Mm -hmm. But of course, sure enough, those screens will close again. And now, how true will you be to what you've seen? It takes a while to acclimate. You know, it's like you come out into bright sunshine and you have to sort of go fade your eyes for a while until you get used to it. Maybe that's what it was, but anyway, I started kind of back paddling. I said, look, you're 45, things just started sorting themselves out for the first time. <laughs> you said, still done, everything's cool. What are you looking for? You just finished so many years with a guru, and what, what are you gonna do now? Start being a hobo again, you know? What, what are you gonna do? You don't know how to do anything else. And I was also invested in being the spiritual persona that I became, actually, to be honest. And in other words, there's a lot of gratification in having people look to you as a spiritual yeah. leader. Yeah, and I had a lot of friends, and these friends, and in that relationship with those friends, there was kind of deference that they were feeling towards me because I knew so much, and I've been this kind of like spiritual seeker and whatnot. You know, that whole yeah. thing that's very... Alluring, right, you know, right. it's very thing. And he also speak very sweet relationships. I had a good relationship with my girlfriend. I was had very good friends. Things seemed kind of normal. Yeah. So for a few weeks, I kind of like, you know, it's almost like I knew he was coming to Europe, mm -hmm. and I had the whole timetable. 
And I knew when he was going to be in London and he was going to be in Copenhagen, like that. I knew the whole thing. And, the, and I, I, I felt I should go and see him. And then the London journey came. And I said, well, I'll go to Copenhagen. Then the Copenhagen, oh, I'll go to Brussels or whatever. I don't remember where he went. And then suddenly it was the time of the last trip. It was the last stop on that trip because he's, he was in Amsterdam. And I, I said to myself, okay, this is the moment of test. If I'm not going to go and see him now, it's going to be one of those spiritual experiences that happen to you, and you get blown away by it, and then you don't do anything about it, and it would have been something to tell, oh, I had that thing with Andrew Cohen once. Oh, yeah, I think that was interesting. I, I should have gone and seen him. And the whole thing will dissolve in no time and life will go back to exactly the way it was. Mm -hmm. Or I better really kick ass here and do whatever I can and, and, and just go. And he was like a drowning man holding on to a lifesaver. I said, I have to do this because this is going to slip away from me. Mm -hmm. And within three days... I, I got the whole thing sorted that I canceled the course and I just went to Amsterdam and saw him. And two weeks later, I, I went to spend a, a time with him in India on a retreat that he was offering. And all this, you know, so it's against... Well, obviously, the Amsterdam thing uh, was gratifying. It was gratifying and I still was a bit kind of like... I was... Like something in me already given up, but something yet didn't admit I've already given up. Yeah. There was something that was not yet admitting, look, it's over. <laughs> just just face the music, you know, it's over. But something did say, wait a minute, you know, gotta gotta you know, gotta check it out, you know. <laughs> so I wasn't even gonna go to the retreat and then the retreat came by and there was this urge, I this feeling of if I'm not going to be there, the world will collapse. That kind of urgency. You know, Maharshi used to sometimes ignite that urgency in us, as you very well remember. And this was completely self-generated here. It wasn't that he was calling me or anything. But I suddenly knew, look, if, if I'm not going to be there, the world will collapse. I have to be there as if, as if my life depended on it. And again, in a very short notice, I arranged to go there. And, uh, and I, uh, I went to that retreat and it was a two week retreat and three days in that, after that retreat, everything just basically, all my resistances collapsed huh. and I knew that my life as it was was really over. Okay. I was ready to, to accept the reality of what I already recognized in that first night. And I came back. And within two weeks, I uh, sold everything in the center I, that I had. I sold my stereo, my air conditioning, my chairs. I transferred the contract to another TM teacher. Everything was just basically within weeks. Everything was closed. My life was packed. I took my suitcases and off I was with him. Did you feel at this stage of the game that you had undergone some kind of uh, shift in consciousness or was it more like a shift in motivation where you felt like the course of action you had to follow was different but but you know essentially you hadn't yet become any sort of different person inside look I don't mm, I don't uh, I don't know what to tell you there was a recognition a deep recognition of a much bigger reality, and there was the guts and the trust to respond to that recognition. Mm -hmm. That's a good answer. <laughs> and the the liber I found that that the guts and the trust that I found within me and the passion to respond to that recognition was in itself liberating. But I still was not, it was still the same ego. Right. It's just that I was sensing that my life is, 
that that one part of my life was really over and I was totally at peace with it. And another exciting, totally unknown, and in some ways very scary part was starting. It's interesting because a lot of times when people go through big shifts in life, like uh, they lose their job or they get a divorce or some big thing happens to them, it's, or they get sick or something, it's, it's, it's very often something that's forced upon them by circumstances that are beyond their control. And if those circumstances hadn't forced them to make a big change, they wouldn't make it. They wouldn't have made it. And, but in your case, you know, the circumstances were good, but you were kind of almost forced from within by a, a, a kind of an inner compulsion to upset the apple cart, you know, and change your whole life and on, on a couple of major occasions now that you've mentioned, three of them, 19, you know, and then, and then when you left Maharshi and then when, when you made this shift, uh, it was all coming from within and you probably also had to a combination of, of things. Yeah. You know, they probably also though had to overcome a certain amount of social inertia, you know, among all your friends who oh, for sure. thought you were going crazy. <laughs> Every step of the way. I mean, uh, uh, it started with my parents when, when I, you know, I was in medical school when I was 18. Oh, brother. <laughs> Can you imagine yeah. how a Jewish mother feels when her son was about to be a doctor, yeah. leaves medical school, not because he's a bad student, but he says, look, this is not for me, mom. It's like, like, a, like, like you, you have it. it <laughs> hey, what's that joke about when a, when a Jewish baby? Comes well, when a Jewish mother, you ask her, how old are your kids? And she says, the doctor's five and the lawyer's three. <laughs> and in my case, it was definitely the case. I mean, I was groomed to be a doctor, definitely. So, <laughs> but anyway, so definitely, you no, know, you had to, these things you had to overcome inertia and and definitely and there was and but the thing is you know there's a beautiful verse in the hadith the hadith is one of the muslim scriptures and, uh, and it's a scripture that that unlike the quran that's considered a revelation the hadith is actually the words of the prophet muhammad mm -hmm. so so there's in one of the hadith, hadith Qudsi, they call it, the, 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 the holy hadith, the mystical hadith, there is, God says something like, I don't remember the exact quote, it's something like, when my devotee takes one step towards me, I take five towards him. Yeah. When he takes, when he walks towards me, I run towards him. Mm -hmm. When he run towards me, I embrace him and make him my own. Uh -huh. So, so I think in the spiritual path, I've seen it again and again and again, that it's a matter of really, it's good that you point this thing about inertia. It's about overcoming inertia. Mm -hmm. And once you take the steps of overcoming inertia, whatever the cost, all kinds of things come to actually support you. Absolutely. I mean, I, I've experienced that many times myself. It's, it's as if nature says, Hey, wait a minute, we've got a live one here. Let's give him some juice, you know? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. And, and I, I remember, actually, when I, the, the day I left, the day I sold everything in my center, it was after the retreat. I was already, you know, set to go. And I sold everything. And I suddenly w was overcome by an incredible anxiety, mm. like completely overcome by the irrationality of what I was doing the impracticality of it. I was literally shaking with anxiety. With, what have I done? And I went for a walk around the block. And uh, I suddenly was not sure even, for some reason I got this anxiety that maybe Andrew will suddenly not call me or not really want me as his student or something. I don't know. This, it was totally irrational, but because I didn't know him very well. And, and suddenly he said, no, I've done all that and I don't even know if he will want me. Just, you know, it was completely right. irrational. And I walked around the block and I suddenly realized, you know, if in, even if it just happened thus far, even really if, let's say, it came to this point that I just closed everything. And something will happen that I will not, for some reason, be able to connect with him as I thought it would be, for whatever reason. That it, even then, it was worth it. Mm -hmm. 
I had to recognize that just to, to have the kind of inertia to make the break, to really crash through the wall, which I thought it was not possible, mm -hmm. and really completely be free from, from that which has become a boundary, in a mm -hmm. sense, because I was so attached to that identity yeah. of the teacher, of the, all that. But that in itself, and suddenly there was incredible liberation came from that recognition. And, and then I was totally at peace. And of course, all the anxieties proved to be completely ridiculous and uh, unfounded, and, right. uh, as most of our anxieties <laughs> often are, completely self-generated. So anyway, that started, that was about 11 some years ago, and then uh, I've been associated with Andrew ever since. Uh, I feel an incredible amount of gratitude and to, I don't know, of course, to Marshi, but to life for having had the incredible opportunity to be with Marshi for so many years and to have such a personal relationship with him and to really be groomed and educated and 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 having interacted with with one of the most uh, one of the most uh, significant spiritual figures of the 20th century, you know. But uh, so there's no there's, I mean, I know that some people. Uh, in order to leave Maharshi, they had to develop an incredible sense of... I mean, some people left Maharshi with kind of slamming the door behind them. Right. And uh, I usually look at these kind of people as if they were... Uh, you know, it's, I look at all these things as, as victimized baby babble. What is it? Because What's victimized that? baby babble, you know, they, they just basically, you know... Uh, he did this to me. It's just kind of completely, kind of basically uh, immature and and pathetic. So I, I have only I have only good thoughts and grateful thoughts towards this incredible man. And but it was over. It was really over. And the, the, and I'm involved very deeply in the spiritual work with Andrew, which is completely different. And uh, and. Uh, yeah, and that's in a nutshell. So I think that was a long answer to it. <laughs> that's good. That's a nice story. So how do you yeah. feel that you have um, changed now in the last 10, 11 years? Um, what, how different are you as a person, um, both in terms of your inner subjective experience and in terms of how others might perceive you and you know, the way you behave and so on? Well, that's a tough one because uh, it's almost a, a dangerous one to go down because uh, uh, to start, first of all, let me say this. First of all, talking about experience, my internal experience, if that's what you want to hear. That which normally people describe as spiritual experiences and, and you know, like for example, in the TL movement, it was the most important currents. And in many other spiritual organizations, spiritual experience and the various nuances of spiritual experiences is equated with higher level of consciousness. Yeah. You have spiritual experiences, you have higher level of consciousness, you have greater purity in your life, etc., etc. Well, I mean, there's big question marks around that area. And in fact, one of the things that that I loved so much about Andrew Coin is uh, is that he actually pokes that balloon uh -huh. uh, very strongly, and, he, and that immediately spoke to me. Right. Because I think we, you and I, have been on the spiritual path for long enough to know that some of the people who have the deepest, clearest, most fantastic spiritual experiences can be outrageous narcissists. Bastards, immoral bastards, and sometimes right out jerks. Well, that's so, why I asked you both about your subjective experience and your behavior, how others might perceive you. Not that I yeah. did perceive you as, with adjectives as strong as that, but um, you know, I'm wondering uh, how you felt. Well, you, you, you continue. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. So no. So I just wanted to to say uh, that I definitely uh, am not going to speak too much about my quote unquote experiences because uh, at least in the in the path that I'm on, the experiences are definitely I mean they're look, experiences are important. Yeah. Spiritual experiences are important. 
they're important as signposts because 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 they're important because they they signal you hey Rick hey Egal you know that three-dimensional world that you live in it's not all that there is there's a much bigger more significant there's there's a bigger reality there's a bigger picture and spiritual experiences are signposts that tell you that remind you that's like a like a poke something poking you and says come on and it also I just want to interject and say that I'm not so much interested in spiritual experiences plural or because you know experiences which can come are going to go uh, right yeah uh, right. It's like uh, there's a, a beautiful story about um, Papaji, I believe it was, who was Andrew Cohen's teacher, and uh, Ramana Maharshi. When they first met, you may have heard the story and could tell it better than I, Papaji apparently ha had uh, really rich experiences of Krishna. And he would, you know, Krishna would appear to him and he would play with Krishna and, and so on and so forth. And um, he got an appointment to see Ramana Maharshi, which was a rather difficult thing to do at that point because he had become very famous and you know, it was hard to see him and so on. And so on the day of the appointment, he, sh he wasn't there yet and it was time for his appointment. And everyone around was buzzing and saying, you know, where is this guy? You know, how, how disrespectful, what does he think he's doing? And he, he ended up, you know, he, he came late and, um, you know, the, he said, well, I'm, I'm sorry I'm late, I, w I was playing with Krishna. And, and Ramana Maharshi said, is he here now? And that floored him, that, that statement, because he realized in, that, in, in the presence of that great saint with that statement that you know, transitory experiences, however, however flashy, aren't, they, they don't cut it. You know, that's, not the, that's not what it's right. all about. Right. The, the, the whole thing, you know, one of the uh, things that, one of the lines that, that one of the one of the things that Andrew keeps repeating, you know, when he speaks about that, and from his experience, was that is that spiritual experience, profound as they may be, do not usually, even of themselves, uh, lastingly enlighten somebody. Right. So, and it's interesting because he himself, his own awakening occurred as a result of a very profound spiritual experience. Right. But, and he thought, well, that means that anybody else, that that would be the way to enlighten others mm -hmm. in beginning days. Yeah. But then he realized, wait a minute, no, people have, can have spiritual experiences and they can maintain the same level of doubt, of self-infatuation, of, of materialism that they had before. I think you can... Uh, I can't even, without necessarily getting into a lot of details, I, can, I think you can, it's, uh, I, I should say that this was really the case with me, that having uh, had such a deep recognition of Andrew, and having had such a, like the first retreat I took with him was uh, a, total inebri a total inebriating experience. I couldn't stop meditating. People would go for lunch, I would meditate. People would go to bed, I would meditate. <laughs> They had to, every night that in that retreat at around midnight they had to lock that room where I, the meditation room so they had to kind of come and whisper in my ear would you please leave <laughs> because I, I they had all the video equipment was there and it's India you can't leave it just unguarded right. so it was this it was I, I found a level of trust in the absolute so to speak mm -hmm. that I've not known even with all these years with Maharshi. Mm -hmm. Is that but he did. Were so drawn to meditate, it was kind of like you were just experienced, or you know, dwelling in the absolute more profoundly than you had been accustomed to, and so you would. You yes, it, there was something. It was like suddenly I realized, wow, you know, this is like this is what liberation is about. This is why people went to caves. Yeah. This is why people left the whole world and just went to cave. They didn't want to know anything about anything for the rest of their lives. What do you think it was about the situation that? had that effect on you? Was it Andrew? Was it India? Was it what? I think there's certain things that you have to just basically, uh, you know, this, you know, this line from the puja at whose door the, you know, the... Oh, God's pray for perfection day and night. <laughs> right, no, there's something else. Anyway, there's this, at one point that you intellect, there's a door beyond which the intellect cannot enter. Right. 
And I think this is one of those things. I had no idea. I mean, I can, what it was, I had no idea and I didn't ask. It was totally unexpected. I didn't expect it to be so powerful. And I, and I think it had a lot to do with the incredible trust that I had in him. I mean, I, I think it did. It seems like you were also ripe for something. I mean, you, you just uprooted yourself from a comfortable life, made a radical shift. So you were, you were ready to, you know, to... Yeah, I came and everything was... I haven't yet uprooted myself. I was still, I was still, I was still not, you know, in some level I have, but in some level I'm still holding on. But I think there was already a trust in him. I really trusted his integrity. And I really knew that this guy is a very serious teacher. He's probably the most serious teacher I've ever met. He is, uh, and I, 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 and, and everything he said, you know, he's gifted with a particular way of, making his words in, in retreats he creates a kind of very charged environment that his his words get alive in your experience uh -huh. he creates a very very supercharged environment mm. it's like the ego is in abeyance the way he describes it your ego is in abeyance uh -huh. and then if you give yourself to that you know then you basically your own consciousness responds yeah that's what happened, and it was it was very powerful. And uh, where, how did we get here? I don't remember. Actually, I, a question arose in my mind, which is that I, if you were to ask Andrew about the nature of his experience, even in this article that you recommended to me, which I read today and which I'll post a link to on the Bat Gap blog. You know, he does allude to his own experience. Uh, like, yeah. so here's a sentence: "I was convinced beyond doubt by my own experience that there was nowhere to go, nothing to do, and no one to be or become." Uh, that was his experience of awakening, right? Yeah, and so you know, I think. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he would acknowledge that awakening, although it's not a, a matter of specific experiences, is an experiential thing. It's obviously not just sort of a a conceptual or philosophical thing. It's the, the ground of our experience shifts in a profound way, and um, ideally, uh, if it's a true awakening, in a permanent way. Um, no, uh, I think I. You see, it's a it's a very tricky thing. It's a question of what do you mean by awakening and what do you mean by enlightenment? Right. Because uh, keep talking. I'm gonna let the cat out here. <laughs> he, I can hear you. Yeah. Well, because. Uh, you see this, uh, the so-called classical idea of enlightenment. Oh, just a minute. Yeah. The so-called classical idea of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea, you know, enlightenment used to be, and for many people still is, right. a situation in which you have a life-transforming experience of the shift of your identity. Right from the separate self, mm -hmm. from the separate sense of self, to the absolute, to the absolute, non-changing, eternal, uh, uh, dimension of life, so to speak, which is completely impersonal, and which completely transcendental, where nothing happens, nothing needs to happen, nothing ever happened, right. and everything else is, oh, it's just a joke or an illusion. Right. That's the kind of awakening that classically was considered an awakening. Now, we, we, we talk about this. This is the classical and the old enlightenment. Look, you have to see also, in, if you talk about the existence of humanity of 50,000 years of speaking humans, mm -hmm. 200,000 years of Homo sapiens, mm -hmm. and out of which 50,000 years of the speaking version of the Homo sapiens, it's not that this particular, it's not that when we got off the trees, the first thing we did was set in lotus and ask ourselves, who am I, right? right. So there were other concerns 50,000 years ago when there were about between 1,000 or 5,000 Homo sapiens around, yeah. apparently, in what now is called Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Their concerns were very much concerns of animals, yeah. plus yeah. Some, yeah. Some, rem some beginnings of something which we now would call civilization. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing about enlightenment is actually re rather new. The whole thing of the concept of enlightenment, even the whole, the whole ability to conceive 
of something transcendental, abstract, right. non-material, is really new and maybe, at least as far as we know from the records, right. may have started with Abraham or Moses as the first monotheistic thing. Maybe. But and also we're speaking in terms of the culture of which we have a record. Who knows right. what, what might go even farther back that records Maybe. destroyed or other places or whatever. But, you know, Maybe. As far as Look, civilization is concerned, true. Let's work with what we have in front of us. Right, I mean, right. a lot of stuff is fairy tales. Right. And fairy tales you cannot, because everybody's got their own fairy tales that they're willing to die for yeah. and, and yeah. go figure which of those fairy tales, which everybody's totally, so is totally convinced and invested in, is the true one, you know, if you ask the Taoists, they were the first ones 10,000 years ago. If you ask Maharshi, it's, you know, it's a eternal Raj, you know, it's... And from what we have, from the records we have, then monotheism started in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't an abstract monotheism. Suddenly they said, no, there's no different forces of nature, there's one force, mm -hmm. and that force is the sun. That was the first monotheism. And at least from what we can tell now, the first abstract monotheism, transcendental monotheism, may have been that of the Abrahamic religion. And that Moses actually brought into a larger populous population. And so that's very recent. And then the first time that you find at least record for a self-referral kind of uh, monotheism, that classic equation of the mystics is, the equation is I equals God. The first time you, ex you hear this express is about 3,000, 20, 2,800 years ago in the Upanishads, mm -hmm. where it says, Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman, I equals Brahman. And then you have Jesus saying this, I and the Father are one, and, and 2,000 years ago, and al Halaj saying it about 1,000 years ago, and Berger was saying, An al Haq, I am the truth, where, the, where al Haq, the truth, is one of the nine, nine names of Allah. So it is new, relatively, but it's old in the sense of it's already been around for a few thousand years. Right. <clears throat> and what happened? in the history of the development of Andrew's teaching is at one point he started, that's how he learned also, it was this kind of enlightenment that he learned, he realized, he, he says in that article that I sent you, realize and surrender, right. that's what he taught at first, he said, you realize the absolute and you surrender to it, he said that's all that there is to do, there's nothing to do, you don't need to change anything, you just do it, realize that absolute and surrender to it. And it's still very powerful, even, I don't know what you feel, I, I feel that when I talk about it now, you know, it's, it's alive, it's as if, you, it's, it's a meditation, just to even con uh, conceptually think of it, it's a sort of meditation. Mm -hmm. it brings you in touch with the absolute dimension of life. But then, he noticed that when people gather around him, and I was not there in the early days, obviously, it was 86, 87, 80, Eight, in those early days, people who were around him in those days say that he was just ecstatic. Like, you'd go into the room and you just, people would have these incredible experiences and they would just want to leave everything. Like going to a cave, they want to leave everything and just join him because he was so powerful and he, and, and based on his own experience of awakening as a result of experience, he thought people are having such strong experiences, we're going to have the revolution of the of enlightened people in no time. Mm -hmm. And Sure enough, he found out that this was not the case. Mm -hmm. It wasn't happening. People were, you know, have peak experiences and, su and surrender to their ego in no time, back into their ego, fall back into their ego. And he started working with people, and then he suddenly realized, he found, he saw that when people gather around him, something happened between them, even not dependent on him. He realized that when he, he, he saw, he says, it, the way he described it, he says, they broke for lunch. And then they came back from the break and he saw people are engaging with each other. And from the corner of, the, of his eye, 
he saw uh, two people talking to each other. And he knew that that which they were sharing between them with eyes open was more significant than what they were sharing in their meditations or with their spiritual experiences on their own. He recognized that there was some, that they were sharing enlightenment between them. That there was a, a new kind of possibility emerged between people. And the moment he realized that, he, it was a profound realization in him that this is really what he should be focusing on. It's this new form of enlightenment where you, tr you, you go beyond ego not only with your eyes closed, which is, seems to be the easier part, mm -hmm. but you go beyond ego while engaging with others. Let me interject and, here. Uh, sure. Because, you know, I mean, there, there's that old Vedic saying, Samiti Samani or something, where you know, in the collection of enlightened, there's Mar Marsh used to talk about this, this sort of uh, whole being more than some of its parts and, and the importance of groups because something much greater gets generated than, than yes. people in isolation. So it almost seems like these are, in fact, rather ancient ideas. Um, okay, here's the thing, though. I, I, I agree with you. And I probably, as a freak of religion, of course, already came with this thing, oh, well, what's new about that, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's this and here and there, and I can supply a lot of quotes to that, I mean, part of my job with Maharshi was to find the quotes. quotes for this exact thing yeah. in the different religions. The thing is, you see, my theory about scriptures is this, mm -hmm. I think they are revelations, I think, you know, I mean, there are revelations that came to people. They're not this kind of, I, I don't buy, but any scriptures at least, this, this has this kind of transcendental, primordial, you know, that the Jews say about the Torah, and Marishi used to say about the Veda. Maybe it is, or maybe it isn't. I don't know. I mean, I think there are revelations that come to people. There are, and there are. And revelations are always the revelations of a much bigger truth than the person had access to himself. And, and it's genuine. I believe it's genuine. It's true. Mystical truths are self-revealing truths, and they have a, a, a status of, of immutability that transcends the human intellect. And, and it's, but it's always in the context of a consciousness of a person. It's a human, and, but anyway, but those revelations, they include within them in seed form also things for future. Right. But whether or not that was actually alive in the culture huh. where that revelation arose is a completely different thing because you judge, it's like, like you judge a tree by its fruit, right? Yeah. And, and. And yes, Maharshi had a very big thing about groups, and I think it was in the air. And he was, Maharshi was really a seer, and he was, uh, he really was a seer, and he really was riding a wave of, of, of I believe, at least, uh, riding a wave of, of, of collecting consciousness and ahead of its time in many ways, and recognizing the whole idea of collective, of coming together. What I think Maharshi missed was, or maybe he didn't miss, maybe he just didn't want to go there. The thing is, I don't believe just, but he, because his groups was just come together and meditate. Right. And that would be the part of the group. Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about. It's still meditation. Mm -hmm. It's still transcending ego with eyes closed. Right. Those groups would come together and they meditate. Here we're talking about something else. Mm -hmm. We're talking about transcending ego with eyes open mm -hmm. while interaction, while interacting. And that during their interaction, a field is created, which is the enlightened mind. Yeah. That is not, does not belong to any of the participants, right. but every one of them is responsible for. Mm -hmm. It demands everything from the individual. It demands the individual to 
be willing to really renounce their ego in a very profound way on the spot, all their egoic tendencies. And it's easy to renounce the ego when your eyes, when you're with eyes closed. You don't, you don't do anything, of course. Then the ego can be in abeyance. But it's when you interact. That's when the whole, well, that's when the, the, the real test is, are you willing, able, and able to put, are you even aware enough about how you act out of ego to the point where you can actually even renounce it? So when you that say is, renounce ego, um, are you saying that you lose a sense of personal identity, or are you saying more that you, you rise above the sort of self-indulgent, you know, self-absorbed, uh, tendency that most people kind of live in on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, look, I mean, take a group of men getting together, mm -hmm. or a group of women getting together, or a mixed group. There's all kinds of motivation that happen in the group. Right. One wants to lead, one wants to appear cute. Mm -hmm. what, there's all kinds of masks that we put, mm -hmm. and we don't know how to live without those masks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are so attached to those masks, we're not even aware of these masks. Right. You can very easily see the masks in other people. But coming together beyond ego means you come together and you're willing to give everything hmm. to put those masks behind you. Because, why? Why are you willing to do that? Not for any religious purpose. I mean, it is, in a sense, religious. Not for any, uh, because, I mean, not because of any shoulds. Mm -hmm. Not because of you are going to gain anything out of it. But because that which is created between you is the most important thing for you. Mm -hmm. And you realize it really is a new being. It's a new being. And that it's the edge of consciousness of where it is now. And it is ecstatic. It is rewarding, but that's not the point. The point is, it is the next stage of human evolution where the coming together is so profound that it's a source of greater enlightenment mm -hmm. than you could ever get with your eyes closed. Yeah. We have a, a satsang group that's been meeting here for years now, seven or eight years, every Wednesday night. Uh, in fact, I'll be going there after this interview. And, uh, you know, when it's really f in, in its prime, you know, some nights are not, eh, but it's when, when, it's really, when it really takes off, there's a, a profound atmosphere in the room. And I come away from that, you know, really surcharged and it lasts for days much more the impact on me than any meditation would have and all we're doing is sitting there talking to each other in a sort of a free-for-all kind of way uh, basically talking uh, as much as possible from you know in a genuine direct way we're not philosophizing we're not speculating we're more just sort of stating what's happening and and corresponding you know with each other on, on that level and, uh, I think that, yeah, I think that's definitely in that direction. Yeah. However, I would say this, this practice that I'm talking about of, 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 of coming together beyond ego and, and it's a, I, I don't, I think it's, it's even a stage beyond that mm -hmm. in a sense of that the players, it, it's high stakes game that uh, it's high stakes because you have to give everything to it and then some. You really have to, you see, because when I say you come together beyond ego, you have to, first of all, be interested enough, bold enough, crazy enough, and you have to have enough heart and guts to face what you're really made of, for real. Well, is there a specific practice that you guys do to bring this about? Or, I mean, you don't just get in a room and chat. I mean, there must be some kind of guided direction that shifts you into this way, of this mode of operating? Well, it's our, 
way of living more than anything else. It's our daily practice. All the daily practice that we do are we have meditation, we have contemplation, we do physical practice. We, we do various things, you know, to, and, but they're all in the service of that. And part of the... Part of the actually, that you're, you're sitting in, the, in a room at Andrew Cohen's ashram as we were having this conversation, correct? So yes. We don't call it an ashram necessarily, but you could call it that. Facility <laughs> or building. But, or... Yeah, but uh, I, am, I am there, yes. No, but I... You see, one of the one of the uh, one of the aspects of the teaching of Andrew Cohen is is the five tenets, uh-huh. is five tenets, uh, which are the five tenets of enlightenment mm-hmm. and uh, or the five tenets of evolutionary enlightenment that he's teaching. And those five tenets, they are kind of the fundamental tool of contemplation, and. And, actu- and, and, and guidance for life that we have. And they're very profound. Uh, the first one is clarity of intention. In other words, what is it that's most important to you in life? A lot of people don't ask themselves that question. Right. And those spiritual people who claim that enlightenment is the most important thing to, to them, if you look at their agenda and how they spend their day and how they spend their money, right. then you would realize that that's not really what's going on. Yeah. So clarity of intention is the first thing. You want to, you, you know, that for you to be free, you have to want it more than anything else. Mm-hmm. The second one is that uh, uh, the law of volitionality. In other words, recognizing that you, that everything that, that in some way, we, in some place, we all know what we're doing. And we're not victims. It doesn't matter what happened to us. It doesn't matter. And some of us, you know, have been traumatized. In utilized in various ways. Who hasn't been? But we are still responsible to take. Res- we we are responsible to take responsibility for all of that. Mm-hmm. And I mean, look, we could we could we could talk for a few hours just on each tenet. But I'm just giving the 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 sure, the, main point. the the thing. The fo- the third tenet is uh, what I was just talking about: face everything and avoid nothing. Face having to avoid nothing is that is on one hand to have the guts and the heart to really know that a lot of our motivations are very dark. It doesn't matter how many years you've been in a spiritual path. It doesn't matter how deep the spiritual experiences you have. It doesn't matter. Any of that doesn't matter. What matters is what is really your motivation. What are you acting out of? And and part of this spiritual practice is to really face that because if you don't face that you can take responsibility for it yeah it's only if you if you if you really if you really uh, face what you're made of and when I say facing what you're made of it's not only negative things mm-hmm. it's also facing your potential facing your because facing the fact that you are important not because you ego is important but you have the power to make a difference in the world in a very profound way by virtue of the fact that you have a consciousness that's aware of itself. So really facing it, not just a theoretical abstract idea, but really facing that whole thing. The fourth tenet is the law of impersonality, where, where you recognize that nothing that you, that not, no aspect of your life, it, it, it's a, no aspect of your life is unique, private, or personal in any way. Hmm. And that's a big one. It's, it's a big one, but it's, it's a challenging and a very enlightening one. You better elaborate on that one just a little bit. Okay. I've mentioned something that, uh, you know, we, we live in an evolutionary context, right? right? We are part of a, of a process that has been going on for 14 billion years. Mm-hmm. Started as a big bang. Mm-hmm. Something came out of nothing 14 billion years ago. And through an incomprehensibly complex process of, of greater and greater structures of integration and order, you know, from energy to matter, from matter to life, life to consciousness, 
and from consciousness to consciousness that's aware of itself. Right. And consciousness being aware of itself, that only happened 200,000 years ago. The first nervous system has been evolved that is, uh, so that is being able to be aware of itself. So you can, if you look at it from, if you look at your own life as part of a process, mm -hmm. not as this individual bubble, skin encapsulated bubble huh. that occurred when you were born and will finish when you die. Right. But look at yourself as part of this process, of this whole process that every atom in your body was there in the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. Every every part, part in the body is 14 billion years old and it kept, and there's a whole process of flux of this river of all those particles forming and at one point uh, the capacity for the individuation arose mm -hmm. Not as the most important thing, but as a tool for the universe to know itself. Yeah. So you are part of that process. So nothing about your life is personal and about you. It's not about you. It's about the process of us, but the process evolving. So in the process evolving, you are the leading edge of that process. You, Rick Archer, mm -hmm. and I, Gal Maria, we are the leading edge of that process. It's not about us at all. And to narcissists in the 21st century, Postmodern narcissists such as we are. This is, it's that's not what we are as a culture. Right. Much of our spiritual development has been about my experiences and my development and my consciousness and my this and my that. It's all about me, and I want to have it just right, and I want to have this just right, and I'll keep on manipulating everything. So it just basically. You know, just like how do you call this, these foams that adjust themselves to your body? Right, memory foams. These, 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 these pillows that adjust themselves and they met this. Uh, so, so we want life to be like that. It's just perfect that adjusts itself. To, to, it's not about us. It's not about us. 14 billion years of this whole process didn't occur so that just you and I can have more gratifying sex life, money life, food, and, and, and position. And, and satisfaction, it's a bunch of much bigger thing. So that's the love of personality gets you in touch when you start contemplating that. It has a very profound effect. Oh, yeah. No, I, I totally understand it. Uh, you know, I, I, when you first stated the point, I wasn't sure what it referred to, but in, in elaborating it, this is a point I've been thinking a lot about lately, especially since I've been listening to hours and hours and hours of interviews of, you know, Craig Hamilton and interviewing people like Terry Patton and Andrew Cohen and all kinds of people, um, you know, it's all you know, talking all about evolutionary enlightenment. So, it's, a, it's a very important contemplation to do. Yeah, and um, and in fact, I mean, even just sort of contemplating these notions does, in fact, shift one's experience. It shifts one's yeah. perspective. You know, as you say, you, you it tends to shift you out of regarding yourself merely as a uh, you know flesh bound individual, but you you know you, you begin to sort of get a clear sense that you know you are that uh, evolutionary energy that has given rise to this whole universe you know but with eyes and with ears you know living through this tool this instrumentality of, of the human body you are you are that very sort of intelligence which sparked the Big Bang uh, you know now able to talk and, and that's fantastic reflect upon itself and so on that's awesome because you see you said Eyes, for example, you know, look, I mean, uh, the way we're built, we built a lot of our, our, the way we project, we interact with the world, a lot of it is through eyes, right? Through sight. A lot of our brain is involved with the sight. Now, there's one organ, the eye, through which we interact, a lot of our interaction with the world occurs. Now, in the same way, you can say that we human beings, are the eye of the universe. Yeah. Because it is through, just like through the eye, we human beings are aware of, of, of where we are in space, mm -hmm. because the eye can be sensitive to light. So also, it's through self-reflective consciousness that we human beings have, the universe can be aware of itself, mm -hmm. and in no other way. Yeah. So, so that's, so, so we are that and that. So the law of impersonality says that, you know, that, look, face, face, 
what your life's really all about. Yeah, we're sense organs of the internet, of the infinite. Yeah, yeah. Instead of the internet. We're sense organs of the infinite. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, we're a colony, really. If you think about it, we've, if, you, if you start going into the microscopic, we've got all these, you know, little or organs, and which you break it down further, there's all these little cells, each of which has its own life. But as a conglomerate, we're a kind of coherently functioning unit. But then, you know, take it to a larger scale, and we're the cells of a larger colony, just right. uh, perceiving or, or sensing and living through just you know one small expression of that totality of intelligence right. that essentially we are. And it has huge implications if you really take it further. It has huge implications because it means that for you, that that, that is the reason for the spiritual life. Because And, and really, that's the fifth tenet. The fifth tenet is, where is the, four, the first tenet I said, is wanting to be free more than anything else, anything else called uh, clarity of intention. The fifth tenet is all about the motivation of why you want to. Because once you understand that you are really uh, the I through which the I, I both as E, Y, E, and I as capital I, of the universe, so to speak, that your interiority is the same as the inferiority of the universe, and you're the leading editor of this process, and in order to take this next step of the evolution of consciousness, you have to actually do it, the motivation for the spiritual life becomes that. And then everything that we talked about, dealing with your ego, dealing with all, doing the spiritual practice, doing your life becomes, if, if you take it on seriously, and it's a big deal, and most people, look, let's face it, most people don't, even people who are in the spiritual path. So it takes a lot, and, and at one point, that becomes your life. And, and you say, okay, so it's for the sake of an evolutionary process. The first tenet is called for the sake of the whole or for the sake of the evolutionary process. In other words, that becomes, it's all about the change of motivation. Mm. So you have those fifth tenets, and the people who come together, if you ask, what is it that brings us, how is it that this thing can happen when we come together? The people that come together in those groups, they're all people that are committed to the five tenets. And, and it's people, this is very serious work. It's very serious work. It's, this is not 20 minutes, start twice a day type of thing. It's a serious work. It cons it's all consuming. And it, uh, it's a work that basically you trust. There has to be an incredible amount of trust that, that you, that because everybody comes totally undefended totally vulnerable, totally with their ego behind, and everybody means business, and, and, and there's incredible trust between us that you will do everything that you need to do in order to develop, and I will do everything that I need to do in order to develop so that this succeeds and we can take the next step and we can keep, de keep developing from time to time, from meeting to meeting. It's not just that we come together in a, an ecstatic communion, mm -hmm. in the higher we, which is in itself an incredible achievement, but also that we each individually keep developing, and as a whole, therefore, the whole, the whole gathering keeps developing. And we work in, in groups that are called holons. Mm -hmm. It's a term that we took from Ken Wilber. Mm -hmm. Holon. Holon is a unit that is composed of individuals, each of which is also a holon in itself. And, and, and we have these holons of people. So these are your peers. And usually it's people you have the same kind of level of experience with. And you're like a, you, like a military unit, like a commander unit. You, you entrust your, your life with each other. It's, these are, this is a very serious work. How many people and are in a whole on? It can be uh, anywhere between four to eight okay. people, something I'm like mainly, that. I, I get the sense as you're saying this that you're mainly talking about people who live there in this facility where you live, or is it people who also might come in for a course once or twice a year and get a taste of it? Or well, there's all, there's all levels. The degrees of involvement. There's degrees of involvement, degree of experience, and there's, you know, Andrew has core right. students, right. which are not that many. And, and, and they are the people who normally, even though I, for example, haven't been for a while living in a center, but they normally they live in a center together, in some center, together with other people, their peers. 
But sometimes they live in a center in, like in my home on, uh, there is one in Germany, one in, uh, two in England. Uh, I'm in Israel normally, and there's four here. So and so a lot of... I mean, you get on Skype calls or something? Or? Yeah, yeah, a lot of the calls are actually on the phone, and it's, mm. it's, it's it, you know, consciousness is not local. Right. And, and, and the, and it works. So when I mean, you, say you fun- work hard at this. Um, is it what are you actually doing? You, are you having a sort of encounter group like kind of, you know, intensive conversation, or uh, you're publishing a magazine? I mean, what is the nature of the actual work to which you're applying yourself? This particular work that I'm talking about, mm-hmm. working hard at this. But what I mean by that is that look, it's very serious. Is what I said. Basically, yeah. it's very it's not, serious. It's not just entertaining yourselves. It's it's a serious. Yeah, thing. it's it's. You mean business. You basically mean business. You come together and you mean business. Right. And right. you say, okay, so so it means that it's total vulnerability. It means that I want to know all the things that I need to do in order to develop myself from one meeting to the next. Mm-hmm. And if I don't, I'm not fully aware of it, then my brothers will point to me what I should be aware of. Some of those things be, for example. I don't know. I mean, maybe, you know, everybody has their own thing in development. Maybe somebody is narcissistic. Maybe somebody is uh, stingy. I don't know. Maybe somebody is uh, is not putting everything that he could into their work. So, for instance, if one of your buddies in the Holon said, Egal, I think you're kind of stingy, would you go back to Israel and start handing out money to the beggars? Or, I mean, what are you going to do to actually effect a change in some area? That would be very... That would be very easy. The, the thing is, it's, it's, first of all, you have, you know, we're talking about, you have to deal with those structures in yourself that, that why are you like that? Not why in the psychological sense, but to first of all recognize that this is the case. First of all, face it and really see, oh, this is the case. And once this is the case, then you are free because that's why meditation is so important. Meditation allows you to have no relationship to the mind, right? Mm-hmm. Meditation is, is a situation in which you take, you have no relationship to the mind, no relationship to anything. That's meditation, it's the ground of being. And then, and then so you're not a victim to those impulses. Maybe I've lived with that stinginess, let's say, for 56 years. Yeah. But once I realize, oh, this is how I operate, so then there is, all the space as a result of all my meditation, of all my all the space to leave room to not act out of it. Well, and maybe it kind of sounds like the old TM model, where you kind of transcend the problem, and then hopefully, you know, from the transcendent, something good gets infused back in, and you know, you water the root and enjoy the fruit. No flipping way. No. Okay. <laughs> no, it doesn't even. It's not even close. Uh-huh. It's uh, uh, here we're talking. Okay. The, the the value of meditation here is not some mystical transformation at the root level that you don't see so what are you doing in this particular right? teaching. Okay. This particular teaching, the value of meditation is basically that it allows you to, to have freedom in relationship to uh, certain impulses in consciousness, mm-hmm. in emotion, in, ma- in mind, in consciousness, that otherwise you would not feel free from. So, for example, I mean, let me give you an example. I mean, I, I'll take a very extreme example, okay? okay. Let's say you're a bit, or, or not so extreme, I don't know. Let's say if you're a habitual thief. Okay. And uh, look, I actually, I, I shared a, a house somebody with, with someday with, with a woman who came from a very, uh, very poor family. And at one point, we realized that there was this kitty that we are using and that we observed that a lot of kitty is disappearing and we actually thought, oh wow, what's going on? And then we, conf- uh, you know, it happened many years ago and and a few of us, we confronted that person and she just, she just said, as a matter of fact, yeah, that's the way I've been living all my life and, and that's it, it's just natural. <laughs> anyway, it's a very primitive kind of state of affairs, obviously. 
And I remember I was totally, we were totally shocked because there was enough clarity that she saw, yes, there's a tendency. But the thing is, if you're meditating with the right motivation, let's say, I'll take that as an example. If you're meditating with the right motivation, it doesn't matter how strong the habit is and how strong the impulse is. You would have enough freedom in your mind that when the temptation comes to just see, ah, here the temptation comes, you slow down the video. Here is when normally this is what I do. Here I can create a different momentum. So, um, what, what are you, let me get, but, but, but what meditation you, is this? I mean, are you saying that if you meditated with the right motivation, if you were this woman, for, in, for example, and that morning you had meditated with the right motivation, then later in the day you saw the kitty, because of the influence of the meditation you had done, you would have more detachment from the situation and be able to resist the ingrained tendency to steal. Yeah, not because of the meditation you've done that morning, but, if, but because of the habit to have some freedom in relationship to the mind that you have cultivated over, time, uh, over years of time of practice uh -huh. with the right motivation. Because meditation, you can be motivation. Meditation is very important. It's very similar to in 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 the Sanskrit when they say sankalpa, your intention. Right. Why it is that you meditate? If you meditate, sometimes meditation is just you want to sit there for a narcissistic pleasure of just having the bliss. Right. But if you meditate, if you're serious, then meditation there will be bliss. But the meditation is more for 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 freedom from mind, freedom from emotions. Freedom from the insanity of the of the total infatuation with you and, and, and identification with your mental and emotional impulses, and a person who would do that with the motive to be free, mm -hmm. and that's the important thing. So, in order to be free, that person would have some kind of a more freedom in relationship to the impulses of their mind, mm -hmm. and would. And it would take interest, though. It would take interest. Right. It would take desire to change. It would take guts, because you have to have guts to go against your habits. Mm -hmm. And But it would, more than anything else, it would take motivation. And if you're in a committed relationship with other people, then for the sake of that relationship, mm. for the sake of that, which not really this personal relationship, but for the sake of that project that you're in, if that project is important to you, for the sake of that project, you'd be seeking to know all those dark impulses within yourself so that you can take care of them uh -huh. so you don't have to act out of them. It's not that you become a saint. It's not that you become somebody in whom no thought of lust, greed, violence, or anger arises. That's not the idea. That's not, that's, that's, I don't know if there is anybody like that. Even Mother Teresa had huge amount of doubts yeah, yeah. it's what it's what you express and what you renounce that and for what it is that you renounce it mm -hmm. that's the idea and and the and and that's among the most serious practitioners of this particular life of evolutionary enlightenment it's basically that's the most important thing that's our profession yeah and then there's concentric circles of people who are involved with it mm -hmm. in various, to various degrees. And there's people who just come to retreats once a year and then they, they love it and then they, they're not involved with it at all beyond that. And that's fine. Well, it's interesting because, I mean, contrasting what you just described with transcendental meditation in which you think a mantra and you're expressly instructed not to go into it with any sort of goal in mind or trying to achieve any particular psychological readjustment or any such thing. You just proceed with complete innocence uh, and, and it's all supposed to happen automatically. Uh, the kind of meditation you just described seems very intentional, very you know, purposeful, that you, you're actually kind of seeking out the dark corners and, and bringing light to them and, and kind of... No, no, not your meditation. Oh, not during not meditation. During What's Not during, during, during the meditation, the kind of meditation you just referred to. Okay, meditation itself, uh -huh. I, I only talked about the, the motive of meditation has to be very clear, the intention has to be very clear. The practice itself is really very three very simple instructions. Okay. Meditation, 
We can do this now if you want. It might not be so interesting for the listeners. Uh, They can do it too. Okay. When they listen to it. So go ahead. Do it then. But it has three different instructions. In fact, I sometimes do it over the internet. I had I I instruct groups. I instructed. uh, I I did a meditation instruction during the internet, and my some friends of mine are doing all the time. But it really is uh, composed of three very simple instructions. Mm -hmm. First, and that's in contradistinction to TM, Mm -hmm. you don't move. You're still. Stay still. You, you sit still. You you, you, you don't move. Can so you, can you sit so, comfortably, or are you supposed to sit? Oh yeah, yeah. No, you sit comfortably. But the idea is, it, it sit reasonably straight, comfortably, with and uh, um, and it means when it scratches, you don't scratch. Right. When it, I mean, if if in a scale of one to ten, you have a pain of degree of nine, well, move a little. Yeah. But I mean, the idea is, the idea is you don't move because. It, I, I would, maybe I would say something before that, but I'm going to teach you meditation. Uh, the purpose of meditation in his teaching is to have no relationship to, uh, to the content of consciousness. Mm-hmm. No relationship to the content of consciousness, which means thoughts, emotions, noises, uh, sensations, fears, doubts, desires. You don't do anything with them. You have no relationship to them. Mm-hmm. And in order to, and, and, and that is meditation. It's a metaphor for enlightenment because enlightenment, there's, a, there's you know, there's movement, there's, it's a metaphor for enlightenment because it's a metaphor. It's freedom. Mm-hmm. If you talk about freedom, is is you you are free from from all that. You we're talking about the old enlightenment, right? right? The, the classical enlightenment. You discover that who you are is beyond all that. Right. That that may still be going on some of it, but you're right. that's not who you are, home, so to speak. Yeah, you are not. <laughs> Things may come and things may go, but I go on forever. Right. And in order to actualize that state in meditation, mm-hmm. there are three instructions. First is you don't move. Right. You're, you, you, you're still. You don't move. Mm-hmm. And there's more to this stillness. I mean, we're not, we can talk about it a little more. But anyway, this is the first instructions. It's more than just not physically moving. The second instruction is uh, you're, you pay, you, you're relaxed. Mm-hmm. And relaxation doesn't mean necessarily, maybe there's tension in the muscles here and there, which, which possibly during the process of meditation will relax some more. But relax means you, you don't hold on to anything. Mm-hmm. It's a fundamental position, a relaxed position of, because we said it's no relationship to thought. Even being still is a is is an expression of no relationship to anything. Because normally, the way we operate is we have a an impulse to move and we just move. Right. But here we say no, no. We we have no relationship. We sh- we shut off the the mechanism that says I have to move according to the motions of my mind. The mind can say anything. Oh, I, I got a scratch. Or I want to. Wa- I want water. Or what no? I want to move my head. I'm not moving. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing. And the second thing is relax, and I'm not holding on to anything. And that's the second thing. It means just being very relaxed. Now, as we very well know, you know, when you don't move and you're relaxed, you want to fall asleep. But the third instruction here is you pay attention. Mm-hmm. You're awake. You pay attention. This, it's, it's, you get sleepy in spite of all that. You don't speak. You don't sleep. You 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 keep yourself from sleeping. That's again a contradistinction to TM. Uh-huh. You don't sleep. You stay awake because when you sleep, you cannot keep no relation to thought when you're asleep. And if you're you tired can, and you find yourself nodding, do you like? What do you do? You don't nod. It's it normally it, look look sometimes of course. Uh, 
you know, there are situations like you haven't slept for 36 hours. Yeah, or you mentioned to me recently that you had meditated for 24 hours straight. Right. Were you consistently applying these three principles throughout that 24 hours? Yes, I definitely was. You didn't move I, for I, 24 hours? Didn't... Well, okay. Uh, it was... I, I never, it wasn't sitting still, it wasn't sitting for 24 hours. It was one day meditation divided into, it was actually that, that particular, it was, a, it was an international meditation marathon. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it was, like a, a lot of us did it right. around the world. Mm -hmm. And we, well, uh, it was also a fundraising thing, but it was also kind of some, you know, a challenge that we took upon ourselves. What we did was we meditate for 45 minutes, and then we break for 15 minutes. And then we meditate for 45 minutes, we break for 15 minutes. And you want to go to the bathroom, you have to eat sometimes, right. you know. And 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 so so it was it was not in, in that kind of sense. You sit for 24 hours. I mean, that I know that there are yogis who are, who are they, they say that there are yogis who are capable of doing that. I don't know that I am. Right. I haven't tried. I see. But for 45 minutes, you don't move. And, 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 and if you focus the entire 24 hours, you really focus. Mm -hmm. and, and we also had some, some, some reading, we call it chanting. It's not really chanting with music, but we just recite certain things. We have these chanting. So your whole state of mind is that of meditation. It's one big meditation of 24 hours. Because meditation is not only... This is a formal meditation, but meditation can also be with eyes closed while you talk. Meditation is not limited to a particular. This is, see, there's spontaneous meditation, mm -hmm. and there is meditation that's not spontaneous, that you have to do something for, some effort. And, and you know that sometimes state of grace, you call it, sometimes falls on you, and, and, and it has nothing to do with no mantra or a technique, you just basically, you're catapulted to a, a, a deeper, saner, freer, a more expanded, less shackled, mm -hmm. uh, tr more true state right. of who you are. And then if you don't do it, then one way of doing it is assuming that position. And so the meditation that I just spoke about is what you do to assume that position. Mm -hmm. And as I said, it's a very serious practice, but you don't do it for any experience, but you do it in order to cultivate. Inculcate? Is that the word? No, cultivate is good. Okay. Anyway, cultivate the state of, of freedom. Uh, not a state of freedom, a relationship, a stand, a position of freedom. Right. In relationship to your insanity, <laughs> yeah, like, mm -hmm. in relationship to your insanity, let's face it, our minds are insane. Right. At least part of, at least part of it. So, so, which kind of sounds to me like, I mean, my my understanding of witnessing has changed a lot over the years from my original conception of it when I first heard Maharshi start talking about it, to you know my experience and understanding now. Uh, but you know what you're talking about fits very well with, with my current understanding of what witnessing is, which is that you know it, you have developed through whatever means a kind of a natural independence from the mind, the, the, the senses, all the all the relative stuff, which is unshakable. You know, no matter how tired you are, no matter you know whether you've just burned your hand or you know whether someone's yelling at you or you know, you're experiencing something very pleasurable. There's this sort of um, pervading and um, ongoing uh, state of freedom, state of independence, abiding. Okay, so, so I, I have some caveats about okay. it here. Uh, I don't know to what extent I would experience or, 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 or have kind of an equanimity equanimous state of freedom my hand was burnt. I mean, I'm saying it's not, it's not, the idea is not that you become a robot. No, no. I'm, I'm, you might be swearing like a sailor with your hand burned. But okay, okay. But there's okay. a dimension of independence. So there's a dimension of freedom. There's a dimension of... Yeah, there's a dimension. Which is just not perturbed by the burned hand. 
Yeah, it's a, a kind of a freedom from a certain freedom, a certain dimension of freedom. Because, yeah, I must tell you, kind of. I'm not saying it's an attitude that you try to maintain. I'm saying it's something right. that okay. becomes so stable that yeah. it's there, whether you think about it or not. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, look. I mean, it's in, in that direction anyway. Yeah. I here want to say a parenthetical. Insert a parenthetical comment mm -hmm. that you know I when I joined Andrew, uh, I actually made a conscious effort. Actually, <laughs> I didn't make enough of the effort in the beginning. I had to have a lot of help from my friends to to realize that it would be a good idea to make effort to just get rid to to just drop the bag. To drop anything I knew, I, or I thought I knew about witnessing, about states of consciousness, about how you develop from CC to GC to UC and all those terminologies, mm -hmm. which anyway didn't really correspond to my experience exactly. Right. And, and I had to just basically say, look, I'm just going to really you know, I'm going to jump here and really go for, for broke mm -hmm. and, and, and leave it behind. Yeah. So that's why I was kind of smiling to myself when you talked about witnessing. I, I am not even trying to bridge yeah. anything. It's not that there was, it's not the, for any disrespect to what Marshi was doing or to, think. it's just basically I had to, I had changed the context and I had to change everything. And the more I was able to drop that whole thing, mm -hmm. the more I was able to be uh, more free in relation to the whole thing. That's cool. And um, yeah, I mean, I haven't plunged into a whole another way of life as you have. I've become kind of independent of the TM movement, but I, I, I've been rather eclectic in a sense in that I listen to a lot of stuff, read a lot of stuff, pick up a lot of stuff here and there. And I, I tend to find that there are, the common, there are many common threads among all these different presentations. Uh, you know, I can hear Adyashanti say something that, you know, is very remin reminiscent of something Maharshi said or hear, hear Andrew Cohen say something or Byron Katie or Gangaji or any of these different people. And, uh, you know, they all have their own spin on it and their own emphasis and their own approach and their own practices and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's, and, and I don't mean to imply that, not, that none of them have the complete picture, but it is reminiscent of the blind man and the elephant analogy in which they're all, you know, describing, you know, similar, well, maybe that's not a good analogy because the different parts of the elephant are so different. And what I mean to say is that a lot of stuff corresponds in, from my perspective, there must be at least uh, there must be certain stuff that does correspond, and that's the teaching level. For example, Andrew's teaching about the ground of being. Yeah, is not new teaching. The teaching about the, the teaching, you know, as he says in that article, he explains in that article that the whole teaching about the old enlightenment, which he still teaches, is part of his teaching sure. about the freedom. Well, we just talked about meditation, freedom from from the content of consciousness is not new. So, obviously, there will be parallels there, and maybe even points of 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 of, of similarity or identity with certain teachings in some way. I would dare to make the outrageous statement that uh, nobody else is really teaching evolutionary enlightenment in the way that he does. I don't think that's so outrageous, and, but I, I might say... Uh, but, but, I mean, I, I'm saying just to protect myself in this age of post-modernity, right. which, which nobody should, should in any way stand out and everything is equal to anything else, I, I think he is a path-breaker in that. Yeah, yeah. And the unique way of teaching. And not just a unique way of teaching, I think... A unique uh, teaching. Yeah, he has a unique teaching, and he and he and he has a and he he forged a path of evolutionary enlightenment in which in which enlightenment he, he really finds enlightenment for the twenty first century, which I, I I'm pretty sure he's the only one who's done that. Mm -hmm. That enlightenment is no longer 
just the realization of the absolute freedom, that enlightenment is also uh, 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 that which is, you know, that, 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 there's, that being is God, yes, but also becoming is God, that, 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 that it's one thing, it's one event. And, and all the teaching that I think he is unique in that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I told you that I sent you the link. It's very interesting. I told you that I sent you the link to this uh, talk that I had with Marshy uh, in 1976. Yeah, in fact, if you like, we can put that link on the blog, too, where we have this other link to this article. But You can do anything. I mean, uh, it's fine. It's a very sweet kind of interaction. It's probably one of the, the first interactions that it is the first interaction I had with him about religion right. it's the first interaction I had with him outside of the TTC context of the TTC uh, in which I offered something creative from my side and he think in a sense that interaction sealed my faith with him but it's interesting so as I was listening to that I remember what I told him was that there was uh, you know that the a bit, um, a very uh, that there was an old rabbi uh, Rabbi Nachman from Breslau, one of the greatest Hasidic rabbis, lived in the 19th century. And he described the mechanics of creation thus. It's a very known Kabbalistic thing. It's not unique to him. It's from the Zohar. The Zohar. It says that the light of God was infinite, and therefore it, it, there was no space in it, and you couldn't create anything in there. But he wanted to make his King, his kingship manifest, mm -hmm. and you cannot manifest your kingship, your kingness, <laughs> without subjects. Right. So he had to create the worlds to make his kingship manifest, but he couldn't create the world because the light, infinite light, filled everything. Mm -hmm. So in order to create the worlds, he had to push his light to the side. And in the empty space that was created, in there, he created the worlds. Mm -hmm. But then Nachman from Breslav asks this question, how, is that really possible? How is this possible that there would be a place where he is not? Right. Because one of the fundamental tenets of the Zohar, of the Kabbalah, is late atal panuimine, which is Aramaic for there is no space where he is not. Right, on, on the present. Right, or what Maharshi used to say, that the unified field is present in every corner of creation. Mm -hmm. So he said, and so this is a paradox, he said, because he had to push himself to the sides, but he was as if he pushed himself to the sides. Right. And he says, this, we cannot understand it at this point, mm -hmm. but he said, in future generations, they will. And I think that what Andrew is doing, I mean, he, Andrew doesn't know any of it. Right. <laughs> He wasn't, even though he's Jewish, he wasn't even bar mitzvah. He, he grew up in, an, in a totally secular Manhattan family mm -hmm. uh, where, where once in a blue moon they would go to a Passover center and his grandfather's and he, they wouldn't understand anything. It would look strange and primitive. Yeah. That, so so he, he knew nothing about nothing when he came to Judaism. But in fact, in a sense, what he's doing is a certain commentary, modern day commentary on that because he's actually saying, okay, that empty space where he is not is also where he is. And now that empty space, it's not theoretical, but it's, it's the empty space where the, that's where the world exists. That's where interactions exist. That's where the universe exists. Mm -hmm. So now let's make the new enlightenment about that as well. Yeah. Not about only about the light. Let's make that also about this in a way that there is, there is no inner and outer. It's one, one, uh, it's one continuous thing of consciousness on the move, and 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 the fact that he found also ways of working with people who are very far from it. And I can tell you my experience. You know, I, I and many of us, we all had to. He had to work with us to really very serious, to, to do very seriously guide us to, to, to be able to, to, to do this kind of work, mm -hmm. where we can, where he now is developing systematizing ways in which he can help larger and larger groups of people to actually embrace that kind of enlightenment. That is very unique, and that is very serious work, and it's, it's very integral, so to speak, in 
to use the parlance, not the, 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 this hip term yeah. of, of, of the day. It's integral because it includes physical practice, it includes mental practice, contemplation, it includes human interaction, it includes meditation, it includes taking care of your health and diet and everything. It's very integral. It's interesting because um, before I even had the thought to um, interview this, you this week, uh, there had been a lot of discussion going on about Andrew Cohen on the, the Buddha at the Gas Pump chat group, um, which there is one of. And uh, I was noticing that it was going on, but I, I really don't have a chance to read all the hundreds of posts that people post there. And uh, so today, I, and this morning, I posted something there saying, hey, I'm going to interview an Andrew Cohen guy tonight, and uh, is there anything in particular you'd like me to ask him? And one person said, well, ask him how he would respond to the paradox or seeming contradiction between Cohen's statement that the world is just fine as it is and his statement that there is a lot of work to be done and things can get better. And this awesome question. Yeah. This is an awesome question. And, and actually, actually, I, I remember uh, one lecture that Andrew gave many years ago in fact about these two aspects that they're both correct. Because uh, it, it's too different. You see, from the point of view of being, everything is perfect as it is. From the ground of being, everything is perfect as it is. It couldn't have been any other way. It is what it is. Right. It's what, what, what Ram Das used to say, be here now. What Eckhart Tolle talks about, he says, the power of now. Is a present moment where everything is perfect. Byron Katie says, "Loving what is." Just basically, that's yeah. that's it. It's just mm -hmm. it is. And even when we talk about this now, you feel that that is right. You know, it's full. Yep. But that's part of the picture. There's another part of the picture, mm -hmm. and that part of the picture is the evolutionary impulse which brought something out of nothing. And that 14 billion years of gushing, rushing, incomprehensible, never resting, ongoing, always changing, uh, pushy, uh, violent, uh, uh, passionate, stream that's also part of the whole picture and so that is so we can talk about being and becoming and that becoming is actually it's like a, 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 a constant rush and urgency and urgency and ecstasy to go and go and go and go and go that's also part of it so it's both the things it's like how can, so the, the question you could say, you know, how can you bridge the paradox between the statement that light is a particle and light is a wave? It's right. both. Yep. And it's also true here, it's enlightenment is both. It's embracing both. And, and that's the beauty of the thing. And I think that is exactly the uniqueness of his teaching. Yeah. And that's really his contribution is that he has brought in not just as a theoretical concept, but as, as getting his hands dirty and actually working with his students who, uh, who and taking a lot of risks also and, and trying things and, and getting to the point where he has now a core group of students who are really committed to this kind of work and, and who, are, who are really making headways with it in a, in a very tangible way. I think that is really his uniqueness. Cool. Just like if you if you think about it, for example, what is the uniqueness of Maharshi? If I look at the, what is the uniqueness of Maharshi, he was he was a giant of consciousness. Maharshi came to a world where consciousness was not even in the vocabulary, in the thought, in the zeitgeist, in our awareness of the Western world, and he managed by hook and by crook, prying with a crowbar. You know, right. uh, uh, and with his charm, with, with whatever way, he just pried open those Berlin Wall of our materialism resistance and shove it, you know, down our 
uh, resisting throats, lulling us with all kinds of promises just so we, you know, a spoonful of sugar and the medicine goes down. And lo and behold, and he managed to shove it in, you know, into yeah. us. So Andrew's contribution is very radical in the sense that he is, he is, uh, he is putting this whole element of the, of the becoming, of enlightenment in becoming, and, and showing ways of working with people so that they can actually transcend the ego, not just with eyes closed, which was actually Maharshi's achievement to actually initiate the world into transcendence with eyes closed, even, even materialist Wall Street people, but Andrew is saying, okay, now, now let's, let's have the same perfection in the way we interact with each other. That's a bigger, it's a bigger deal in a sense. My wife is yeah. bringing me my dinner here, which I don't think I want to try to eat while I'm talking to you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I w there's a lot of things in my mind and a lot of, I think we could go on for another two hours easily. With, easily. And I think it would be a bit, a bit much to try to do that right now. But um, let's, you know, let's have another session sometime. I, Sure. Yeah, I mean, this is a, as good a note to end on as any. I think what you just said is is very profound and moving, and I and I'd like to have another session. Um, so you know, in a few weeks, a couple months, whatever works out for us both, uh, let's do that. We meanwhile, I'll post this, and people will re watch it and and maybe start commenting on it, and I'll I'll kind of note down some thoughts and points and questions, and and in fact, if they start asking questions, you might actually like to interact with some of them there. In, in, you know, on the blog or in the chat group, if, uh, I'll, I'll bring it to your notice if something comes up that I think you might like to respond to. This has been uh, yet another episode of Buddha at the Gas Pump. Um, the implication of that term being that the, the sort of states of, you know, enlightenment or, or whatever you want to call it that were once considered to be fairly rare and unusual are uh, being encountered, and as Egal has been saying, in even more evolved ways by ordinary people in ordinary circumstances. Um, and we will continue unfolding this. I believe this was the 18th or 19th such interview, and uh, God willing, there'll be many more. So thanks for watching, and uh, if you go to batgap.com, you'll see sort of all sorts of possibilities of you know, things to get into, like the podcast and the discussion group and all that stuff. Uh, so. Thank you very much. This has been Rick Archer interviewing Ego Harmelin and uh, Ego Moria, and we'll see you <laughs> next time.